Hello, and welcome to the first installation of our five-part webinar series addressing conservation here in Sherburne County. My name is David Wick, and I'm a district technician here at the Sherburne Soil and Water Conservation District. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the beneficial trees and shrubs for pollinators and wildlife. So what do we mean when we're talking about pollinators and wildlife? Well, let's start off with pollinators. Bees. Everyone thinks honeybees or bumblebees when we're talking about pollinators, but there are a lot more bee species that are responsible for pollinating that um, other than the honeybee and the bumblebee. So to start off, we got the bumblebee, but we also have, you know, yellow-faced bees, uh, carter bees, sweat bees, and resin bees. And each one of these bee species has a preferred flower or type of flower or tree or plant, and it needs these in order to survive. And those plants in turn also need these bee species in order for them to reproduce and survive as well. But it's not just bees that are important for pollination, it's also flies. So, you know, here we have a serifid fly, but it also looks like a bee. So, you know, you can differentiate between bees and flies by bees have four wings, flies have two wings. So the, the serifid fly, the bee fly, and the blow fly. But it's more than just bees and flies. It's also beetles. It's birds like hummingbirds, um, as well as moths um, and butterflies. So here we have the monarch. This is the hummingbird clear wing moth. It's a very, very cool moth. It actually does have clear wings as you can kind of see in the, the photo there. The common buckeye moth, the polyphemus moth. The polyphemus moth specifically is associated with hardwood forests. It's one of the largest moths in uh, Minnesota, and it's very susceptible to light pollution because it uses the moon to help locate mates during its reproductive flights. And we also have the IO moth. So long story short, it's not all about attracting bees. Instead, of, it's attracting diversity to your landscape. Landscape. And if you want to learn more about pollinators, uh, Franny's going to be giving a webinar on March 23rd all about the importance of pollinators. And that'll be really good. She knows a lot more about pollinators than I do, so I'll let her handle all the, the pollinator stuff. Uh, moving on, well, you might be thinking pollinators are great, but I'm more interested, you know, in the stuff I can see from my window, you know, the birds, the wildlife. Well, it starts with the plants and the trees and the shrubs and ultimately the insects that they attract. So I can go out, I can plant non-native trees and shrubs, and they're not going to attract nearly as much wildlife as it would happen if I went out and planted native trees and shrubs. Um, I'll get a little bit more into native versus non-native on the next slide, um, but native insects are essential and they're often overlooked, uh, but they're a big part in attracting wildlife, um, specifically birds and especially birds. So caterpillars are the best food source for growing and developing birds, and they're absolutely essential in successfully raising birds from egg to adulthood. So the caterpillars are extremely nutrient rich and calorie rich, and they're also very soft, which makes them easier to swallow and digest, you know, versus, you know, a grasshopper or a beetle. But they have that, that higher nutrient competition, content, and they're just easier for um, uh, the, the birds to digest um, and process those nutrients. So to make it easy, greater the di diversity of the native plants and trees, greater greater the diversity of the insect population, and ultimately the greater the diversity of the wildlife. So outside of birds, it also is the deer, the turkey, the grouse, the rabbits, the squirrels, the foxes, the snakes, the small mammals. So all of that we need insect life for. And ultimately, if we have the right plants, we'll have um, the right insects, wildlife, and whatnot that we want. So. Before we get into the recommendations, let's go back and talk about native, non-native, and invasive. So native, we're talking about, you know, your red maple, your sugar maple, your red oaks, your white oaks. Um, the non-native, we're, we're talking the ginkgos, the Siberian elms, versus the invasive of, you know, buckthorns and prickly ash. So what we're going to be talking about today is strictly the native trees that have been here for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, but you might be saying, well, why, why does it matter how long they've been here? Well, because over the course of those you know, hundreds and thousands of years, they've evolved, they've changed so that they become you know, better suited to their environments. 
And along with that, the insects that feed off these trees have actually been right, evolving right along with them. So plants and trees have a leaf chemistry. And when we're, we're talking about they're evolving towards that, uh, that better suited for the environment, um, they're actually evolving you know, defenses towards insects so that they don't get eaten as much, or they're evolving different flower shapes so that they're more likely to become pollinated. So just as the trees change their leaf chemistry or, or the way their flowers look over the course of thousands of years, so too are the insects. They're adapting their, their stomach chemistry to go along with the, with the leaf chemistry or they die. So an easy illustration of this is, you know, monarch butterflies. They only feed on milkweed, um, which is poisonous to the majority of other insects. But because of the way that, that the caterpillars have adapted and evolved over time, they're able to eat um, the milkweed that's poisonous to other things. So other insects have relationships like this with trees and plants and shrubs and whatnot. Um, they're just a lot less well known. Um, but again, they're essential to the landscape um, that they're often overlooked. So. Now that we have a little bit more background and understanding, uh, let's kind of, let's get into the recommendations. We're gonna start off with my favorite, and that is the cottonwood tree. So the cottonwoods are very valuable for bees and pollinators. They're a very, very large tree. It'll grow upwards of 100 plus feet at maturity, and they're very fast growing. However, one consideration is that you're gonna wanna plant cottonwoods away from pavement, away from structures. The roots are very aggressive at, at seeking out water, um, so if you have, so if you, you irrigate your yard, the roots will naturally grow towards the surface because that's where the water is. And that can lead to some structural issues down the road and also issues for you when you're, you're mowing your yard. Um, if those roots are close to the surface. You want to be constantly hitting them with your uh, mower blades. Uh, a lot of, another issue people have with cottonwoods is, you know, all the cotton that they produce. So there's actually a male only varieties that have a lot less cottony seed. Um, as far as insects that you're going to attract, um, I don't have numbers for every single tree that I'm recommending to you today, but I'll give you the numbers that I have. So cottonwoods are able to support 368 species of caterpillar, moth, and butterfly. We call this group of insects Lepidoptera, um, and that's specifically the, the populations of insects that I'll be talking to you about. So if you want to look more into that, um, Lepidoptera. Moving forward, we're gonna talk white oak and bur oak. So white oaks, they are very important for acorns. They're a great food source for turkeys, deers, rabbits, wood ducks, and squirrels. Mice also like to eat them. And the, the bur oaks specifically provide a very deep shade. So you can see on that right side, the right picture there, you know, pretty much no sunlight is getting through to, to the ground. And this was very important um, pre-European settlement. Uh, Sherburne County here was an oak savanna. So that means there was a lot of prairie grass with single or you know, a handful of oak trees interspersed throughout the, the, the landscape. So you know, wildlife needed this refuge from the sun during the summer. And you know, these bur oak trees provided that super dense um, shade. They're also a, a long living species and because of you know these these characteristics with that dense shade, their their ability to just have that full sun for for 12 hours a day, they do very well as a lawn or a park tree, and they can grow close to 80 feet at maturity. However, they're a lot slower growth um, speed uh, versus you know a cottonwood tree. The the oak tree is able to support 534 species of the Lepidoptera, the the, the caterpillars, the, the moths. And this is one of our most productive trees here in Minnesota, based on how many insects they're able to support. Heading on towards the black walnut, the nuts again are great food for foxes, squirrels, rodents, and lots and lots of bird species. The tree can be considered messy, so again, you're not going to probably want to plant it next to your pavement or next to your house. And then the tree is also allelopathic. This means that it secretes a chemical from its roots that actually inhibits the growth of certain other plants uh, species. So don't plant the black walnut next to your garden. It's specifically allelopathic towards plants like tomatoes or potatoes or peppers. Um, however, if you're planting it in you know, a yard setting, the Kentucky bluegrass, 
it won't have an issue at all, and you're not going to have to worry about the allelopathy. Um, uh, black walnut can grow close to 80 feet at maturity. Going on to red and white pine, uh, red squirrels and birds love the seeds. Uh, beavers and rabbits and porcupines, they like to eat the bark. So this can be a bit of a catch-22 because you're attracting wildlife, but they are damaging your tree in a little bit. So keep that in mind. You know, you need the wildlife to, to consume the, the, the trees or the shrubs in order for you to be able to see them. So there will be some damage. However, you need to attract the wild, you, you want to attract the wildlife to your, to your property. So the red pine is the tree you're seeing on the right. And the white pine is the tree you're seeing on the left. An easy way to tell them apart is that the needles on the red pine are gonna be a little bit sharper, a little bit longer. And they're also gonna come in bundles of two versus the white pine. They're gonna be a little bit shorter. They're gonna be a lot softer. Um, and they're gonna come in bundles of five. My personal preference is white pine over red pine. I'll leave that up to you to decide. Um, when these trees are young, deer love to eat the buds off of them. So one consideration if you're planting these trees is you might need to put up a fence or a bud cap. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with a, a lot bushier versus a lot taller of a tree um, because those buds are what is um, stimulating the growth for next year. So if the, the deer keep eating off that top bud, instead of growing up, it's gonna grow out. Um, and you're gonna look at close to 80 feet at maturity. Uh, the red and the white pine are able to support 203 of those Lepidoptera species. And moving on to snags. So snags are actually dead standing trees and they're absolutely essential to wildlife as well as fungus. So the woodpeckers, love eating, you know, searching out and finding the little grubs that are uh, decomposing the wood. But the hollowed out centers are great homes for, you know, wildlife, not just raccoons, as, as well as other, you know, ground dwelling species. Um, and they're essential in, you know, a natural landscape. You know, dead trees might not be great near your backyard setting. However, in a natural woodlot, they're extremely important um, to leave out there. Now, if you have close to 50%, you know, dead trees, snags, you might want to remove a few. However, you know, 10, 15%, that's, that's totally fine. And that's actually quite beneficial to the ecosystem. So moving on from large trees to medium trees, we're going to start with the pin cherry. It's a very hardy tree that provides home and feeding for songbirds. Um, the fruit ripens in the middle or the latest summer, and it can be used to make jellies and jams for humans, as well as, you know, just a great food source for a lot of songbirds. It grows very quickly and it has, and it flowers at a very young age. So you can see in that picture, you know, those are pretty, pretty young trees and they are absolutely covered in blossoms there. Um, and it can produce, it can support, you know, close to 450 different species of those insects that we were talking about early, earlier. Moving on to the hackberry. The hackberry is probably my favorite medium-sized tree. It's, um, it's a great, great habitat tree for you know, insects as well as um, birds and small and animals and rodents and whatnot. Um, it's the berries are songbirds' uh, favorite or one of their favorites. Uh, and you know that corky bark, it's just such a statement. You know, it looks scraggly, it looks beautiful. And it's just something fun, you know, to look at out your window versus, you know, every, everyone has maple trees or everyone has oak trees. So it's just something different. Might be something you like. Um, it's a very good alternative to ash or elm trees if you don't want to worry about, you know, disease or pest problems. The fruit is also very popular for uh, winter birds. Moving on to the red maple. The red maple provides a very good cover and nesting for birds. Um, the fruits, or what I would call the helicopters, provide great food for squirrels and other rodents. They do very well here in Sherburne County, especially versus a maple or a sugar maple. The red maple tree loves our sandier soil versus the maple tree loves a much more moist and rich soil. So I highly recommend planting red maples over sugar maples here in Sherburne County. Um, it's a very early flowering species, which makes it beneficial to pollinators when they first emerge from hibernation after winter. 
So you can make syrup from red maple. However, uh, the sap content, the sap has a lot lower sugar content, so it's just not nearly as common. Um, another maple species that is non-native but highly planted is the Norway maple, um, and they're, they're non-native. And studies have shown that they're used at a much lower rate as a food source compared to the native sugar maples and red maples. So I think this does a very good job of illustrating that you know, native trees and plants are much more productive for the environment than their non-native lookalikes or things that can also fill the same ecological niche. They don't produce nearly as much life um, as the native species do. So going forward, we're gonna talk about the black cherry. Um, bees and flies are the, the pollinating species. Um, dozens and dozens of birds eat the fruit as well as mice, squirrels, chipmunks, and foxes. And it's extremely, extremely productive as a native tree. So the difference between the black cherry and the pin cherry is that the black cherry is gonna be about 50 feet tall at maturity versus the, the pin cherry is gonna be a little bit smaller and closer to uh, 30 feet. Going on from medium to small and shrubs. So we'll start off with the red osier dogwood. Uh, it's a very vibrant winter um, shrub. So you can see on that far right picture, these bright red stems and they'll stay that bright red color all through winter. So, you know, it might be a great tree to, to have out a window that you can see. And, you know, it just gives you that little, little shot of color there in the middle of winter when you're tired of looking at all the, the gray or the, the melting snow. So just that, that great, that vibrant color. Um, it might attract your eyes, but it also attracts the, the eyes of deers and rabbits and chipmunks. They love to eat this, the twigs and the foliage. And during the summer, um, it attracts bees and butterflies to pollinate. And those white berries, those white berries are great for wildlife and over a dozen bird species eat berries. And white is actually their, their fully ripened color. So the red osier dogwood, it's more of a shrub than a tree and it's really good for hedges. So going on, let's talk about the wild plum has a white flower in the spring. It's really great for pollinators and it produces these, these reddish plums. As you can see in that middle picture, they're about an inch in diameter. They are edible for humans as well as animals. And the plum can be grown as a shrub or a small tree. It's very drought resistant. So that's very good for here in Sherburne County. We have slightly uh, droughtier, sandier soils. So it's one of the first to bloom in the spring. It blooms typically in late March or early April. And this is perfect for um, pollinators because they need that early food source. And you might be able to see in that far left picture, it actually blooms before it leaves out, which is just kind of an interesting fun fact for you. Moving on, let's talk about crab apples. So crab apples have a pink or a white flower. Um, the native crab apple to Sherburne County is the prairie crab apple. However, it's not your most beautiful tree here. So um, what I'm showing you here in the picture is the red splendor crab apple. It's not native. However, it does a very good job. Um, it, it's still able to support, you know, close to 300 species of insect. So it's, it's kind of getting the the, the kick in the door, you know, it's not native, but we'll, we'll take it, we'll accept it as our own. So it provides great cover for wildlife. It is a slightly later bloomer than, you know, the wild plum. So it kind of is producing that, um, that food source for the pollinators all throughout the season. So multiple bloom periods are very important for pollinators. Um, so here you can see the, the red berries that it produces. Um, and these will hang out all winter and they provide a great overwintering food source for a lot of birds as well as small mammals. Uh, moving on, we're gonna talk about the red hazelnut. So let's talk about the flowers first. In that bottom right-hand picture right here, this is the flower. This is the female part of the flower and this is the male part of the flower. So. It has red flowers. It produces nuts for squirrels and deer, turkeys, grouse, quails, and jays. And the nuts are edibles. 
you know, for humans as well, but you gotta, you know, you gotta beat the squirrels to them. So the male flower part, as I was pointing out earlier, this part right here, this is actually a staple part of the diet of the ruffed grouse and turkeys during the winter. So if you wanna improve your grouse habitat or attract more turkeys to your landscape, maybe think about planting a couple of these. Um, they're able to support 130 or so um, of those Lepidoptera, the insect species, those caterpillars and whatnot. And moving on to the mountain ash. The mountain ash is going to be a small tree. So it produces these white flowers um, in the spring and these are very important to the pollinators. The, the berries are important to wildlife as well. You can see they produce these large clumps of berries and um, it's something you know that's kind of just getting into the area potentially is emerald ash borer. Um, mountain ash are not susceptible to emerald ash borer. So that's a worry that you don't have to have. And it's a great way to add diversity to your landscape. And you're probably looking at close to, to 30 feet at maturity. So some things to consider before you, you, know, you go out and buy a new tree or a new shrub. So first figure out why are you planting it? Are you planting it to attract more wildlife? You know, some shade to you know, help out with your utility bills? Are you trying to, to block the neighbors off? Or, so whatever reason, figure out your reason so then you can choose the right species to support that reason. That's gonna give you the best results. And then the space. Do you have enough room for this tree at mature height? You know, you can plant a sapling anywhere, but when it's, you know, 100 feet tall, 60 feet tall, 40 feet tall, is it gonna be able to, you know, still fit in that landscape? So you can see that bottom right-hand picture, you shouldn't have planted quite that large of a tree there. That might be a better location for a shrub versus a 40 or 50 foot tall tree. You're gonna have some foundation issues there. The tree is not gonna be structurally sound. It can't put its roots out in a, you know, a full umbrella pattern. So think about the area before you, you choose, choose a tree species. Um, and then once you kind of have your spot, look at the soil. And, you know, like I was talking about before, the red maple is gonna do a lot better here in Sherburne County than the sugar maple. If you wanna learn more about, you know, how to figure out what soil is good for your area, uh, March 16th, we're gonna be talking about the web soil survey. So it's a great resource to help you determine what soil is on your property and you know what kind of species are gonna do well. And then, you know, you've looked around you, you've looked down and now look at the other species around you, um, the diversity. You know, you can plant 10 silver maples, 10 sugar maples, 10 red maples, and that's great. It helps the environment. But you know, the one thing better than 10 of the same thing is 10 different things. That's gonna help out with your diversity. Um, attracting, you know, different wildlife, different insects, different uh, pollinators. And ultimately that's gonna help your, your yard, your, your forest, whatever you have. And it's just gonna make it that much more resilient to change in the future. So if you have any questions, I will be here for the next half hour or however long it takes and we can get those answered. All right, welcome back. So if you have any questions, um, that about wraps up the presentation. So now we can take any questions you have and give you some better information. Feel free to unmute yourself, put some questions in the, the chat and we'll get them answered for you. So we'll start off from the chat. Are hackberries a good shade tree? And what is the, the fall color? So the fall color of hackberries that's gonna be a yellow, somewhat similar to an aspen, but not identical. Um, and then as far as shade versus sun on the hackberries, hackberries like partial to full sun. So if it has partial sun, that's about six to eight hours a day versus the full sun is you know eight to 12 hours a day. And what is the best strategy for watering new trees? So the best strategy is to soak your tree not versus a, a daily um, irrigation. So what I mean by soak is you're gonna wanna give it, you know, 15 minutes of a steady stream of water, you know, right at the base of the tree versus, you know, five minutes, you know, just right around all around. Cause what happens is that the, the turf grass will actually absorb, you know, 90% of the water. 
So you're, what you're trying to do is get that water to infiltrate all the way down to the roots versus just you know the top six inches of the soil. So um, they, they make tree watering bags. You can do it yourself at home with a five gallon bucket with a, a hole in the middle and you just you know, fill that up. I'm talking like a really small, like an eighth of an inch hole. So it takes you know, 10, 15 minutes to totally empty out that whole five gallon bucket. Um, but basically you're trying to, to slowly water the tree versus you know, just giving it a, a top dressing of a water. So allow the water to actually get to the roots versus just to the, the grass. So the next question, how long should I wait to cut down an oak tree with oak wilt once it dies? The leaves all fell last summer, so I suspect it will not leaf out this year. Um, cut it down right away. There's no, there's no reason to leave it standing. It actually becomes um, more dangerous um, if it is up and standing. Um, obviously, with oak wilt being the concern, it will be more likely to transmit to other trees. Um, so you're going to want to remove that oak tree. Um, there's a lot, a lot more going into oak wilt um, than we could, we should, probably should get into tonight. So if you have a question uh, with oak wilt specifics, feel free to give me a call tomorrow. I can uh, address that a little bit better. But as far as waiting to quarantine the tree or anything like that, feel free to take it down right away um, so that hopefully it won't spread to as many trees. So are there any conifers that do well in Sherburne County that aren't as susceptible to deer browse? That's a hard question. Um, every tree is susceptible to deer browse, some more than others. Um, the spruce and the, the firs are gonna be a little bit less uh, susceptible to that deer browse. So, you know, a white spruce or a, a con color fir, those are both very good options that are, they, they do well here in Sherburne County. The, the sandier soil doesn't seem to affect them quite as much. Um, so the white spruce, the con color fir, they're gonna be a little bit shorter than the, the red pine and the white pine. Um, and just, those are more typical of, you know, a shelter planting um, or a windbreak. Feel free to keep the questions coming. These have been really great so far. And if you'd rather talk it out, feel free to unmute yourself and you can have a conversation too. I bet someone's got a question out there. When's the best time to prune trees? Well, now's a really great time to prune trees right before um, right before spring kind of hits. Um, some trees are gonna be better to prune um, in the summer, some of our fruit trees. So when in doubt, Google it. Um, otherwise, dormant season is a really uh, kind of the catch all. If you're not sure, dormant time is the best time. So. Right now is actually a really, really great time to prune your trees. So that's something you need to do or you think you need to do. Get on out there and do it now before, I, before it gets too warm and before that sap gets flowing. So that's kind of your, your best time is while the sap is not flowing. But if you have certain trees in particular that you know you wanna, you wanna double check before, um, Feel free to Google it. it. It's usually pretty obvious. If not, give me a call and I'd be more than willing to talk you through it and help you out. When is the best time to transplant a young tree? So typically the best time to tr transplant a young tree is going to be right in the spring. Um, hopefully before the tree starts to bud out. Um, once the tree's budded out, um, it causes a lot more stress. You know, it just put all of its energy it had saved up in its roots into those buds. So um, pre bud out, um, but the springtime will be your best option. Um, but if it's already budded out, I would recommend waiting till the next year or waiting till the fall, you know, once all of the leaves have dropped. Um, the fall is an okay time. However, we do see a slightly higher, you know, mortality rate. Um, it's just a little bit harder on the tree, it stresses it out a little bit more going into winter where, you know, it's obviously stressed out during the winter. So. If you can, do it in the spring. Otherwise, um, the fall, once all the leaves have dropped, once that sap has stopped flowing, and, you know, if you have the uh, ability, you know, a slightly larger hole just so there's less 
soil disruption. And if you are transplanting the, the trees even in the spring, um, do it as large of a hole as you can, just so that you're disrupting the roots as little as possible. And it just gives that tree that much um, better of a chance of surviving because no matter what, when you're transplanting trees, there is always some risk. However, you know, there's certain strategies you can take to, to mitigate those risks. David, I have a trick question, kind of. I only answer tree questions. <laughs> what do you, like if someone wanted to just put one species on the property, but they wanted to attract like the most variety of wildlife, what, and it could be a tree or a shrub, what mm -hmm. species would you recommend to attract like the most kinds of wildlife or pollinators? I would probably recommend the black cherry. It's gonna be, you know, a slightly, slightly, it's medium to large tree. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, it, it's, it has all those flowers in the spring. It has the berries that, you know, act as a food source during the summer as well as the winter. Um, it's a little bit faster growing of a tree. It can handle a little bit of shade. It can handle a little bit of sun. So, excuse me, um, it kind of just fulfills all your, all your little bit of requirements to attract uh, different kinds of wildlife. So you'll get the birds with the berries, you'll get the small mammals, hopefully you'll get some larger mammals too coming in, you know, the deer, the turkeys, whatnot. So I had to choose just one, it would be the black cherry. Otherwise, oaks are always, or white oaks in particular, are always a very good option. If you're looking for a slightly larger tree, still going to attract a lot of wildlife uh, with the acorns. So I would Personally here in Sherburne County, I choose a white oak or a bur oak over a red oak, just due to some oak wilt concerns we have. You know, as, as other people have uh, talked about, we do have oak wilt in the area. So just something to keep in mind. So do we have planting instructions? Yes, we do have planting instructions. Um, I'd be more than happy to, to provide you with instructions. You can talk to me tomorrow or later. Um, however, just some basic ones are plant a, or dig your hole twice as big as you think you need it. Make sure all your roots are going down versus, you know, they're hitting the bottom and they're looping back up. That's going to lead to issues in the future. Make sure you're watering it, you know, at least, you know, three or four times a week that first few weeks, and then you can kind of slow down as things, um, as, as, as the tree has started to establish itself a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, just keeping, keeping an eye on that tree that first year, you know, it's going to need constant watering, you know, once a week, twice a week when it gets hot, you know, even more than that. So making sure your soil stays moist, making sure your, your roots are, you know, pointing downwards versus um, all kinds of hay work, hay or crazy, you know. So, and ultimately, you know, that, that extra large hole will be beneficial. Um, it just ha not having compacted soil right next to the roots is very helpful. It kind of just gets them, gives them a jump start. It allows them to get going in slightly softer soil. You know, there's a little bit more air, you know, it allows for the, the water to infiltrate down faster and a little bit easier for them. So you can only do one thing, dig a bigger hole. How will we give it just uh, maybe one or two more minutes? If you have any burning questions you want to ask, type them in the chat. Um, we got one more. What is the best way to remove shrubs? Well, um, every every site is going to have its own constraints. However, if you're wanting to remove the roots and all, I would recommend you know cutting them off at a, a decent level and then you're, you're either going to have to, you know, get a shovel out and start digging at those roots or connect the chain to the back of your car and start pulling or somehow pull those roots out. Otherwise, there are root dissolving uh, substances that you can buy. So you just cut off the, the tree or the shrub in this case and you can actually, you know, I mean, I've never used the stuff myself. However, I've talked with people that have and you essentially put it on the roots and over the course of you know one or two growing seasons, it will essentially dissolve the roots, and then you can put something else there um, that is going to 
take a bit longer. However, there's a lot less disturbance, a lot less work on your part. So depending on you know what whether you want to plant something right away or whether you want it out of the way for, for good, um, there's a couple different strategies you can use. But ultimately, you got to cut the top off first and then decide on how you want to deal with the roots. Or you can just leave the roots in there and not do anything about it. I'll just add add to that just quick. Um, uh, when it, it, I mean, if you're talking about removing like an invasive shrub like buckthorn, um, unless you're unless it's like a whole you know couple acre or acre woodland where you um, might need to do a little more drastic measures with um, using mechanical tools or things like that. Um, what we found for like smaller areas uh, is just called the cut stump method. You just cut like about an inch above the ground and then you dab um, that stump with um, some kind of herbicide that's specific to um, woody species. And it, it's, it's good to do it that way because you're not, if you're like versus spraying, um, because you're not, you know, accidentally hitting things that you might want to keep in proximity. If you're just dabbing uh, that herbicide on the cut stump, it's just hitting that specific plant and then that'll kill the root system. And it's the best to do that in the fall because that's when they're um, kind of storing everything down into their roots. So they're pulling um, the, all the water and nutrients in their tissues down into their root system. So when you put that chemical on, they're gonna pull it down into the roots versus if you did it in the springtime when they're flowing everything up to you know, send uh, leaves out, uh, they're just gonna flush all the chemical off of that stump. So that's just another method um, to do for shrub removal. Any more questions? Well, uh, that kind of wraps it up. Uh, David, do you have any closing statements? Yeah, and if you, you think of some questions tonight or you know tomorrow or in the coming weeks, feel free to reach out and we can we can talk about it. We can get into the specifics of your site and give you the best recommendations and get, get the most wildlife you 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 want on your property. Um otherwise if you you forget something and you want to go back through, we will be posting the recordings on our YouTube page. Um so feel free, that'll probably be up by the end of the week. You know, gotta give us a little time here on our end too. But um Otherwise, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out, whether it's plants or trees or shrubs, um, we'll get you taken care of and give you the, the best uh, solutions to your questions, so. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a great night. Have a nice night.